Good evening. At Hyde Park tonight, we feature a personality who has been uh, the reason why several uh, medical advances have been made across the world. Um, this personality is um, the ambassador of science, technology, and innovation for Sri Lanka, the recipient of the Global Innovator Award at the, the Other Than a Sri Lankan of the Year Award. Uh, for 2018. Let me warmly welcome Dr. Bandula Vijay, who is in Sri Lanka from Houston. Uh, good evening and a warm welcome at Hyde Park tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Vijay, a scientist, engineer, and uh, inventor, and has invented over 20 medical devices. He's named the inventor on uh, over 20 US and international patents, uh, as I mentioned before, and over 30 medical de device patents in his name in the United States and internationally. And um, his tent inven invention uh, is one of the most widely used stents in cardiovascular inventions. I'd like to speak more on that, but I think your subject area, education, health services, innovation, I'd like to start there, Dr. Vijay. Um, where Sri Lanka stands today and where we need to be in the years to come? That's, that's a very interesting question. Um, Sri Lanka is at the, the door of innovation. There is a lot of attempt made, is underway in Sri Lanka for to entice innovation in the country at uh, both at uh, elementary, secondary school education level as well as at universities. Uh, but it really needs a specifically designed program, uh, cultural uh, change uh, in preparing the work uh, students and the workforce eventually to develop an innovation-based economy. Mm -hmm. So in education is the backbone. Innovation is the future of this country. Uh, through innovation, we can compete with any country in the rest of the world, including the most developed countries like uh, United States or China. We can be competitive with them, provided we have the mindset and the culture uh, to bring about that innovation thinking uh, during the formative years of education as well as at the university level. You said provided <coughs> the mindset and culture for innovation. Do we have that? How do we uh, instill that culture, Dr. Vijay, going forward? I mean, uh, you bring us a lot of expertise and experience from the United States where innovation, it's, it's, it's uh, very normal there. Mm -hmm. But in Sri Lanka, we're still, we're still um, trying to uh, promote a culture of innovation in the country. How do we lay the fr uh, resources and infrastructure needed to go there? I think we start with uh, these two words need and want. Uh, most of our thinking in the human behavior is we have needs. Uh, so we need to get education, we need to get a job, we need to have a house. I think that uh, if you change that, uh, that culture from need say, to want, uh, then it is more than what you normally accomplish. I want to be successful, I want to be an innovator, I want to develop us as a major uh, innovation-based economy. So it's a want, not so much as a need. I don't know how uh, the, the actual, uh, the two similar words in Sinhalese or Tamilese, but these two words mean uh, quite a bit of different things uh, in someone's life. As I get educated uh, in my, uh, my high school in Gaul and through university and so on, it's more than a need for me. I want to, I want to achieve uh, certain things. So this is a very important thing. Talking about uh, yourself and um, some of the uh, patents that you hold uh, to your name, uh, I think these advancements in uh, the field of science, medical sciences, have saved millions of lives, and uh, particularly the STEM. But um, I think uh, in the commercialization of these um, innovations in Sri Lanka, that's a challenge for, for many of our inventors. What do you think we should do? Like I said earlier, the, the backbone of uh, de the development, innovation, uh, is the education. You have to have the right type of education. Education should not be something 
you provide the student with a bunch of facts and the student uh, is tested how much facts uh, the student has retained. I don't think that brings about an innovation mindset. Mm -hmm. So we, really we, we basically have to drop this concept of fact-based education. Instead, we have to uh, adopt a system of uh, active learning and an education based on problem solving, critical thinking. Mm -hmm. So instead of providing the student with knowledge, we provide the student with a, with a skill set to acquire knowledge. Because uh, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. what I learned in O level and A level is basically obsolete now. Right. So why would I want to spend so much time acquiring uh, knowledge that will be obsolete 10, 15, 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. And even the recent past, if you look at the things we did just a few years ago, mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. So things change. But the most important thing is, can we adapt to this change? Have we learned or are we provided with the skill set to adapt to this change and bring out new change, new knowledge? So I think this sort of uh, cultural change is necessary in order to uh, bring about uh, a, a country that is based on uh, innovation, or in other words, innovation-based economy. Economy. As the ambassador of science, technology, and innovation for Sri Lanka, um, I'd like to know uh, what measures you propose to the government, especially in the education sector, the higher education sector going forward in order to bring about this innovation-led <coughs> uh, economy and also to move away from a fact-based education system? Actually, uh, India, you uh, start, uh, asked a very, very important and interesting question. I have been talking about this for the last several years. If you look at our system, when a child is born in this country, from the very first day of that, per that child's life, the most important goal the parents have is how does this child get through advanced level? Mm -hmm. this, this is the most important thing for a parent. Um, maybe m my parents, who were both teachers, probably thought the same thing. Fortunately, they directed me somewhat in a different way mm -hmm. than simply wanting to pass the advanced level. Right. If you look at advanced level, uh, most advanced level question papers are eight or ten questions. Uh, or a few multiple choice questions. But it is, it is not possible to, to, to assess a student based on just eight questions. Mm -hmm. So we have to come up with a system that the progress of the student is evaluated from the kindergarten onwards, not just with eight or 10 questions or 50 multiple cho choice questions at the end of 13 years of schooling or 12, 13 years of schooling. So the, the child gets assessed. And that assessment goes, has to go into a database. So we are not actually wanting to fail the child. Mm -hmm. But we are, our purpose of our test is to find out what, what skill set does this child have. For example, there may be a child who is very good in art mm -hmm. or a child who is very good in mathematics. Right. Okay? But our goal should not be to see we have a test and this child fails the test or pass the test. That shouldn't be our goal. Our goal is to uh, evaluation system or a testing system, if you want to call it a testing system, right. is to see what is his skill set mm -hmm. and then direct the child in, uh, into the direction where he has some more skill. Right. But then again, you know, one may be skillful in a certain area mm -hmm. when he's 10 years old, would be skillful in a different area when he's 25 years okay. old. Mm -hmm. That's okay. But at least we have an idea what what is, not everybody is good at everything. So our examination system should be to find out what is this child good at. Mm -hmm. uh, it should not be a way to fail the child. Right. So we have to adopt this system to start with. Right. right. Then we have to go to, uh, instead of fact-based uh, education, more of a uh, problem-solving, critical thing thinking type of uh, education system mm -hmm. where you are given a problem to solve, and the child learns how to solve the problems. Another important aspect of our culture is that oftentimes the child proceeds in the life by himself, myself. Mm -hmm. 
individual. So we are very individualistic in our culture. As a nation, we cannot go forward by being individualistic. Right. We have to move as a group. Not just me going forward. I want to make sure that people around me also go forward. Mm -hmm. So when I'm at the top, I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. There are other people with me. Right. So we have to develop a culture to, as in a classroom, the classroom is not assessed how well you do it. You are assessed how well the class does it. So if you are a student of in a classroom of 30, your grade doesn't depend on how well you answer the questions. It has to depend on how well the entire class answers the questions. Right. So I that forces the student to work in collaboration. Right. I think, uh, Dr. Vijay, we were talking about something very interesting. Move away from fact-based uh, fact education towards an uh, innovation-led economy. And how do we get there? What education systems do we implement? But I'd like to also highlight the fact that uh, uh, Sri Lanka's literacy, we boast about 92% uh, uh, literacy rate, uh, the highest in South Asia. But again, a recent World Bank uh, report um, had a questioned uh, the quality um, of education over quantity. And I think we come back to uh, uh, the topic, the, the, the note that you made here. Are you also of the view that um, our education system doesn't uh, uh, really unleash the potential of our students? You uh, mentioned the word quality. Quality is a picture. Quality depends on how you look at it. You might look at a picture and say, that's a beautiful picture. And I might look at the same picture. And I might say, well, it's OK. It's not that great. So when we talk about quality to someone, it's not quality to somebody else. The most important aspect of a quality is, what is the end result? Are we able to develop new industry, do disruptive development, mm -hmm. think about new concept in sciences, in business, in arts, and are we able to progress as a nation, just like other nations in this area has done, like Singapore, uh, Taiwan, or South Korea have done. Mm -hmm. All these countries are the same size as we are, or similar size as we are. So are we progressing like that? And if we are, yes, then the answer to your question is, yes, we have. If we are not, then the answer to your question is, no, we don't have it. We have to rethink about how we are doing it. What are we doing it? Are we doing it right? What else should we be doing it? And, and then adapt a system that will help us to move forward, don't you think? So um, of course, uh, I am preaching about this uh, critical thinking type education as against the fact-based education. But at the same time, one of the other important aspects is we need not only well-educated people, mm -hmm. but we need uh, lots of them. If we have just a few, I think that number in Sri Lanka is something of the order of 8%. Right. Because, uh, and of the 8%, something like less than 3% is in sciences. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to medicine and engineering, that number is even lower. All the sciences taken together is about 3 or 4%. Mm -hmm. 3 or 4% in a country is not enough to, to move this country forward. So we have to provide a lot more opportunities for people to get educated in such areas as science, mathematics, and IT and technology uh, education. Because with that number, I think we can move, it, uh, move the country forward. The, the lack of this, uh, this uh, workforce, I think, is, uh, is, is a problem for Sri Lanka. Some of the most technologically advanced uh, countries of the world um, have a major budget set out for research. <coughs> um, in Sri Lanka, this is a challenging area uh, given our system. Uh, but how do you think we uh, actually uh, should move towards um, encouraging research-based innovation, research-based education? So you, 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 uh, your, question, uh, your question has two parts. One was uh, the resources. That means, are we putting enough resources for to educate our populace. Mm -hmm. uh, then you asked, uh, uh, what, what, uh, how, how can you improve this uh, education so we can be productive, we can be disruptive, right? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, to answer the second question is, 
we have to assess the students based on what have they done during the time period they entered the university uh, schools from kindergarten to uh, the 12th or 13th grade advanced level what have they done have they just simply acquired knowledge or have they done something other than acquiring knowledge mm -hmm. have they done some social service have they done some development have, we, have they gone to a village and done some projects in the village to improve the lives of the villagers mm -hmm. so this is a this is the whole package it's not just learning a subject like you know mathematics or physics and say oh i know physics and mathematics so i'm a total person but in order to for the country to develop we have to develop a total person not simply so someone who is who is knowledgeable in a certain area of of uh, sciences or even arts for that matter the other question you asked was the, are we uh, invested have we invested enough Mm -hmm. into developing our, our uh, populace. Right. As if we concentrate on the government being fully burdened on educating the populace, mm -hmm. then I think we are going to fail. Mm -hmm. Because the government doesn't have enough money in right. order to do everything that is needed in the country. We should open the doors for people to get educated whether they are educated in the government institutions, mm -hmm. government universities, government school, or they are educated in private schools or private universities. Right. Some of that does exist in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to open it up so more so that more and more of the students can be educated in various institutions around the country. Interestingly, the ones who can go into the private institutions are the ones who uh, have the funding to pay for it. But we have to open up those private institutions mm -hmm. for those who do not have the funding. Right. For example, I just read an read article about Harvard University. Now you, you know the most, one of the most uh, famous universities right. in the world. I think 30% of the students that enter Harvard have received some sort of scholarship funding and they do not pay their high tuition the other other students pay so if you have private institutions one of the ways that you can help the people who do not who cannot afford is to have a, some percentage of the students should be taken in who who do not have the money to pay for it right this also brings our discussion dr vijay to uh the number of inbound students to Sri Lanka, it's, it's a very um, uh, uh, small number, 986 students, uh, degree students, and uh, we are looking at um, across campuses in Sri Lanka, but we have a large number going out of the country uh, for education purposes to Western countries. Uh, but again, about private education as we speak about that, how, how do we improve uh, the infrastructure for private education in Sri Lanka? Is it a policy perspective that, ne that is needed? Or uh, is it some sort of infrastructure um, that we need to set up uh, in the country in order to improve education so that we also retain our foreign exchange and improve the quality of education here? You know, this is a very, very difficult yet very interesting question. You know, I lived in the United States most of my life, actually. So my thinking is I'm a free thinker. So I am uh, basically against any kinds of rules and regulations that control this or that. Mm -hmm. So if we have to accept private education, we don't have to put rules and guidelines about private education. It has to come from the result. Let's say, thousand, you mentioned something about 900, some number, thousand enters mm -hmm. the state schools, right. and the 900 enters uh, private schools and they come back. If the private students, when they come back, if they are able to perform as well or better than the state students, mm -hmm. with time, it is people are going to understand. It doesn't matter which school you went to, you perform based on your skills. Nobody is going to ask which university you went to. For example, if you go to a doctor in, in the United States, nobody asks the doctor, by the way, doctor, where did you go to medical school? They don't ask that. It doesn't matter anymore. 
after the first after the first couple of years, nobody forgets. I went to a top university in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. the, we, we talk about this my, my, my university only during football games. <laughs> Other than that, nobody asked me, "Oh, did you go to this university?" Yeah. Oh my God, no. <laughs> but that's all forgotten. What depends is what's important is what is your capability. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter which school you went to. What are you able to do? Mm -hmm. So I think this is a problem. It will solve by itself. Just do not restrict it. Let the students go to private schools. Let them come back. Let them work. Let the students go to state schools. They come back. And this system exists very well in Brazil, for that matter. Mm -hmm. In Brazil, uh, the, the good students in the high school, they enter the state schools with uh, higher uh, grades. And the, the school uh, students who don't have the, the best uh, grades, they enter private schools. Right. But end of the day, when they come back, they all work together. And it doesn't matter who went to which school, yes. so long as you can perform. Right. The um, situation is a little bit different in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, in the top schools, like Harvard, MIT, Caltech, right. USC, uh, they take s top students irrespective of whether they have a lot of money or they don't have a lot of money because they take based on your skills. Mm -hmm. But when they come out, some of them are very, very successful. Some of them are not. As a medical profession, I'd like to divert our attention to private medical education. Uh, there was uh, a big debate about privatization of medical, um, medical education. And uh, of course, we talk about SITEM then. Uh, I'd like to know going forward whether Sri Lanka should completely be uh, away uh, or just uh, put a full stop to private medical education, or should this be encouraged? If that is uh, encouraged, what regulations do we have, uh, do we need to have within the country? You are uh, basically uh, asking me to uh, touch the third rail uh, of education in Sri Lanka. That's the most dangerous rail. <laughs> well, I'll try to answer your question uh, based on what I believe in and what I see happening in the rest of the world. In the United States, uh, we produce about 16,000 doctors a year, and that, that's definitely not enough. Right. So we bring about another four to 5,000 doctors every year from other countries. Mm -hmm. So the beautiful thing about our system is these, these doctors who come to the United States to practice medicine, they have to sit for an exam. This exam is called USMLE. Mm -hmm. It has three parts, actually four parts, step one, to uh, C to CK to CS and part three. Mm -hmm. They have to take this exam. Mm. But the beautiful thing is they take the same exam that a student in the United States also takes. Mm -hmm. There is no different exam. It's the same exam. Whether you went to Harvard Medical School or whether you went to some other medical school, totally unknown, or whether you went to medical school in Philippines or China, Sri Lanka, or anywhere in the world, you sit for the same exam, so you are either accepted mm -hmm. or you're not accepted. Mm -hmm. So it's very fair. There's no two different set of exams, so one for American students and one for foreign students, right? So I think to start with, we have to uh, uh, s develop a similar system, one exam for everybody. The other is we have to have a comprehensive exam Comprehensive exam means that an exam that is conducted for basic sciences and clinical sciences separate or even after one year of uh, internship. So this exam should be a comprehensive exam. It should not be an exam that has fact-based questions. It should not be an exam that has 8, 10, 15 questions. It should be a multiple choice exam probably divided into two or three, three hour segments uh, mm -hmm. in the exam. So by, by doing this, then you bring everybody under one, uh, one system. And that way you can allow the students who go abroad to come back and practice here. And then we can also have students who go to private schools uh, like, like the Saitam, which doesn't exist anymore, mm -hmm. also uh, to be taken into the healthcare system, national healthcare system. 
I think this would be a simpler, easier way to solve the problem of uh, the sort of medical education or the lack of uh, doctors in, in Sri Lanka. WHO reports that we have 0.8 per thousand uh, population, 0.8. Mm -hmm. uh, India is similar. India is uh, no better, it's uh, about 0.8 as well. But uh, if you take Cuba, that's six physicians, six doctors per thousand. Mm -hmm. If you take most of the European countries, uh, they are like uh, in the range of five to six per thousand. Right. In the United States, we are 2.31 per thousand. Mm -hmm. So if you consider those numbers, uh, you know, we, we basically don't have enough doctors for our population compared to some of the uh, similar countries as well as the developing countries in the world. Right. Developed countries in the world. The government launched plans to transform the country into the most cost-effective and quality higher education hub in Asia. This was um, by way of uh, inviting more um, private education students from overseas for private education. But again, I'd like to talk a little about uh, government um, spending on education, the budget allocations. Um, our education spending stood at 2.1% uh, of GDP in 2015, and then it represented 7.3% of all government uh, spending in 2014. Uh, that was earlier that year. Um, however, last year, government allocated uh, 102.8 billion rupees in education. This was uh, quite a significant amount compared to the previous years. Now, this is going towards the 6% of GDP, the pledge to provide 6% of GDP, but we are far um, below. Uh, what, what do we really need to do in order to allocate education um, funding effectively in order to make sure that uh, the budgets are properly um, uh, diverted to the most needed areas of education development? So, as a country, we always want to develop into uh, manufacturing. One of the things that we can manufacture is educated people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, well, we have garment manufacture, we have electronic manufacture, we have manufacture all sorts of things. I think we can manufacture you know, educated people. Mm -hmm. This was one of the things that I proposed in, uh, in a recent talk I gave. Uh, in during my last visit, right. we can make Sri Lanka the education hub in Asia. There are so many people, so many young people who want to get educated and they don't have the infrastructure or the facilities mm -hmm. and they are willing to pay to get that education. So it is no brainer for government or private enterprise to establish universities in IT, in medicine, in engineering, in sciences right here in Sri Lanka, doesn't have to be in Colombo, it has, can be outside of Colombo, where you can provide good quality education that is uh, parallel to the level of standards that are available in the United States or Western Europe or China. So uh, this would be a, a tremendous thing that the government can do. The income that the country gets by providing this education, I would imagine would be very similar to some of these uh, imported, uh, the, some of the income we get from exports of uh, various products that we manufacture. I'd also like to talk a little about artificial intelligence. Now, the information technology sector uh, has said that they will prioritize data science and artificial uh, intelligence in its drive to sharply increase exports uh, despite facing uh, shortages of uh, skilled people, as you mentioned. and. Um, what I'd like to ask you is in order to foster uh, innovation in these areas, how we can uh, inculcate that into our education system? Uh, an area you've been touching on, but artificial intelligence, the next level, how do we go there? So you have, you have asked a very complex question, and I have to do divide into a few parts to answer that question. Mm -hmm. uh, so artificial intelligence is an area that I'm very interested in. Uh, matter of fact, I had some research projects going in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, probably know that I'm a professor at uh, Kotalaula Defense University, and one of the projects I'm doing uh, there is a project based on artificial intelligence mm -hmm. in healthcare. Right. Uh, so, uh, artificial intelligence, interestingly, is like what I said earlier. You can look at a picture and you can say, 
what that what you see in that picture right. and I can look at the same picture and I can say I see something different something. and same thing is true of artificial intelligence what is artificial intelligence honestly I do not know but it means different things to different people so in the project that I'm, I am uh, doing or the research project I'm doing to me artificial intelligence or machine learning is a way that we can minimize the professional who is taking care of that work, making the minimum amount of mistakes. Mm -hmm. Because when we do certain things, it all, it all depends on how we feel on that particular moment, whether we are an uh, airline pilot or whether we are a surgeon who is operating uh, on you or, or, or some doing somebody who is doing a critical job. Right. It depends on you of how you feel that particular moment. So you can do good or you may not do good. Mm -hmm. When you allow a computer to do that work for you, under your guidance, under your supervision, the computer will not make that mistake. Mm -hmm. The computer doesn't have family problems or family issues or headache or, or you are, the computer is not late to work, you didn't have problem getting into the bus. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so the computer will be more accurate. But obviously I am not a person who says, that sooner or later the world will be taken over by artificial intelligence. And there are so many people in America who are against that, uh, uh, in, including people like Elon Musk, they, they, they have commented on it. So uh, I think there is a place for artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. and that is in doing routine things, mm -hmm. like healthcare, for example, okay? Right. So uh, the next part of the question you asked is, how can we use this uh, in order to do things better? So this has to be done in a very careful way. Uh, one example is, I'm sure we, we both have a card in our wallet mm -hmm. that we can go to ATM machine and, and pull some money out. Right. If you remember, not long ago, about 15, 20 years ago, uh, we had to go to the bank, stand in line, go to the teller and get the money, right? It made a huge difference. So the number of jobs that the tellers had gone. Mm -hmm. So there is, a, there is a, 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 a deflection point at which that artificial intelligence and quality of life right. may cross the boundaries. Mm -hmm. So one has to be very, very careful about that. Right. So when we, people like us who are developing this sort of new technologies have to be very conscientious about what are we going to do? Are we going to help or are we going to hurt? So this is a very important, uh, very important aspect. Right, I think on that note, Dr. Vijay, I must thank you very much for your uh, insights and for sharing your expertise with us here at uh, Hyde Park as Sri Lanka aspires to become an innovative economy by year 2030. Um, thank you very much and uh, I wish you all the very best in your future endeavors. Thank you for having me. Uh, we had with us Dr. Bandula Vijay, Ambassador, Science, Technology and Innovation for Sri Lanka, one of the most eminent uh, inventors of medical devices with more than 30 medical device patents to his name in the United States and internationally. We'll see you again next Thursday at the same time at Hyde Park. Thank you very much for joining us. Good night.